discuss more generally about how the famous emerging market economies are now making their voice heard on the world stage. Very pleased that you're here with us, Gita. And then my old friend and colleague, Martin Wolf from the Financial Times, uh, who is probably the most read economic commentator in the world, I would say. And he moves with the, the gravitas of a finance minister these days, or several finance ministers. And he always manages to combine a certain amount of gravitas with the ability of bringing out his columns uh, regularly on time. Uh, many finance ministers don't bring out their budgets on time, but Martin manages to produce his columns on time, and they're always incredibly well worth reading. So Martin can speak about anything, and he's here today to talk about the world economy and the rebalancing thereof. And these days, with politics and economics being in a state of flux, it's probably actually not a bad time to be the senior commentator of the Financial Times. It's probably not such a bad time either to be in charge of coordinating investments, particularly in a place like Indonesia. It could be that it's slightly more problematic if you're a politician, because politicians do have to act. And that, I believe, is the reason why the third member of our panel, Christine Lagarde, is not with us today in person. That is the bad news. The good news is that she's here with us in cyberspace. And she's recorded for us uh, a, a message of 18 minutes, which just shows how much aptitude she has to put into words all the depth of feeling she feels for the St. Gallen Symposium. She's going to talk to us now for exactly 18 minutes through a video link. So we're very pleased to welcome Christine Lagarde. And for those of you at the back, particularly those of you who may be falling asleep, all you have to do is just look at the screen. And it's as though she's here. So please suspend disbelief. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Christine Lagarde. Monsieur le Président Erzinger, dear Philip, Chairman March, dear panelists, dear Martin, dear Gita, if I may, first of all, let me apologize humbly for only offering the background of Notre Dame in Paris and poor me through wires, electronic devices, that actually allow me to be with you on screen as opposed to physically with you. I offer my apologies and I actually owe to St. Gall. I suppose this does not reduce the imbalances of gratitude that I have to you as an organization for having me yet again, although very notionally and virtually, for the second time. Not only do I apologize, but I wish I was there, and I honestly mean it, because it would give me a, a breath of fresh Swiss air to get away from um, quite a lot of work at the moment on the European scene and on the national scene. Turning to the topic of post-crisis rebalancing, I'd like to congratulate the students of St. Gall and the organization for having selected the topic. And one could actually wonder whether post-crisis is effectively relevant. And I would suggest that we actually assume that post-crisis is the relevant reference, that we have actually moved out and away from the heart of the crisis, from the peak of the crisis, from the worst of the crisis, times when employment was destroyed, time when mortgages were foreclosed, time when so much value has been destroyed around the world. Those were the two years, 2009, beginning of 2010, although 2010 marked the rebounds of the global economy. I used to say in political circles and at home that the crisis would be over and we would know that it is over when our economy would start creating jobs yet again. As many jobs were destroyed in 2009, in France over 300,000 jobs were destroyed. The French economy has picked up and has begun to create net new jobs in the amount of 125,000 in 2010 and the forecast for 2011 is quite good, stronger than 2010. So I can legitimately, legitimately turn to my constituents, to my base, and say, yes, we have pulled out of the crisis. 
Yes, by devising new agencies, new players, new schemes, reinventing the financing of the economy through massive stimulus packages, we've restored the situation. We've restored it, but have we rebalanced it? And is the goal to have the appropriate balance, to use a very quoted qualifier? Interesting question, actually, whether we need rebalancing and whether balancing is the right act to be had. I think it goes without saying that for decades before the crisis, or many years at least, we discussed about the vice of imbalances. Remember the double deficit, the twin deficit, the imbalances between, uh, say, China and the United States, between European countries in the same Eurozone sometimes. And yet this did not in and of itself constitute a default situation, an event of crisis, no. But it was a very fertile ground from which the crisis was born and evolved and erupted on our domestic scene without much notice, actually, in the autumn of 2008. But it was very fertile ground, actually, to have those imbalances in various corners of the world, and not much having been done to actually address the issue. In the period running from 1998 to 2007, no less than $2 trillion dollars accumulated between surpluses and deficits of the G20 countries. I'm looking at my notes because I don't want to quote wrong numbers. It is actually the number of $2 trillion. Massive amount, massive imbalances between countries that deal with each other, trade with each other, invest into each other as a result of this incredible free trade movement and opening of markets that has taken place not only since the Doha round in 2001, but for quite a few years before. Although quite a few years, not so long ago, we had exchange control. We had foreign direct investments review and controls. So we're not totally addicted to that free movement, that lack of financial repression, to again use a quoted word. As I said, global imbalances did not cause the global and the financial crisis, but it was fertile ground. And it is more the dissemination of risks, fragmented, segmented, disseminated around the surface of the globe in financial markets, that eventually caused, together with the complete lack of confidence that resulted from a major default that actually caused this financial crisis that operated just like a meltdown, where finances just dried out from the surface of the globe in a matter of hours. Now, facing that reality and the destruction that followed, we all had to take exceptional measures, measures and we did. We did in the urgency of the matter. And as mentioned for France earlier, but that was the case for most countries, we put together massive stimulus packages to restore the economic and financial situation. We reactivated financial pipes that had dried out. And by so doing, we obviously created massive, massive amounts of public debt. And from a situation where public debt was pretty much under control, navigating within the Eurozone, for instance, at a range of about 60% of GDP, we escalated that to amounts ranging from 80% to sometimes 160% of GDP, which is probably nothing compared with what Japan had accumulated, not in terms of deficit so much, but in terms of debt. And here, obviously, I'm talking about debt. Debt to GDP increased massively as a result of those deficits that we had to create because we needed to inject public finance where there was no alternative finance available. And obviously we are now back to a situation where our aim 
is to restore balances or at least to reduce the imbalances that we lived with and that created that fertile ground fueled by lack of confidence, disseminated risks, insufficient or lack of regulation. As we're facing this post-crisis situation, clearly we need to address imbalances, the risk of worsening or improving the imbalances and making sure that the other components of the crisis do not resume so that we can avoid the resurgence of yet another crisis of the same nature or another nature because obviously history does not repeat itself so much. So what are we doing? Obviously I'm going to talk about the G20 because France is chairman, president of the G20 until November. And if I may say, at this point in time in the year, we are moving from, from Cannes, festival time, to Cannes, G20 summit. From film to finance and from entertainment to economy. And fortunately, although I was part of a, of a very good film that I would encourage you to, to watch inside job. I'm not in the business of film. I'm not in the business of entertainment. I'm more focused on finance and economy at the moment. Now let me identify for you two major tasks that we have assigned to ourselves for this French presidency of the G20. First of all, we want to reduce the imbalances that we've had, that we still have, and that could create, again, fertile ground for yet another crisis. What have we done for that? We've identified a project together, members of the G20, with the IMF, which is called the Framework for Solid, Sustainable and Balanced Growth. Yes, we believe that growth we need. Yes, we believe that it is should be sustainable and yes we believe that it should be solid. Balance means that we accept all of us to address the imbalances and the causes for imbalances, the roots for imbalances and are prepared to mitigate those imbalances, deal with them. We've been through two meetings already in 2011, one in Paris, one in Washington. During the first one we were able together to identify what would be the economic indicators to determine the risk of imbalances. During the second meeting, we were able to agree on the guidelines that should be adopted to select those countries that need possible adjustment. Of the G20 countries, seven were identified because a very tight net was applied to the criteria used for those. Those countries include obviously the usual suspects, all those countries that are considered systemic and you can easily take the list of the top seven, you will find them. The next step which is going to be the most difficult one actually, it's always the case, will be the step when we actually identify the remedies, the new policy mix, the special devices that need to be used over a period of time so that we can actually address the imbalances risks and try to redress them. That will be the job that will unfold and hopefully be completed at the Cannes G20 meeting in November. I'm working hard against that schedule and background and uh, I hope that all members of the G20 will be equally determined to actually turn that objective into performance and results. There is a second task that we've assigned to ourselves, which I think is critical as well when it comes to imbalances, because it actually deals also and touches on the first one, this framework for solid, sustainable and balanced growth. And that is the international monetary system. We have at the moment an international monetary system that is a bit skewed. You know, it dates back to the Bretton Woods arrangements. And in the meantime, obviously, the world has changed. Economic powers have emerged. 
Others have, sub well, have, have at least uh, reduced in size and impact. But certainly the world has been a lot more open and adjustments has taken, have taken place in a massive way so that emerging powers are no longer developing countries. But some of their territories, some of their areas are as developed, if not more developed, than traditional developed economies. And simultaneously, the monetary system has not evolved much. We still have pretty much the same system with the IMF, obviously with more money available, with more flexible instruments, but still pretty much performing in the same fashion. So we need to gradually, step by step, try to address a situation where exchange rates, where capital flow movements, where liquidity needs are properly addressed in a fairly, not codified, but at least agreed way, concerted fashion, so that measures are not taken in a harsh and unpredictable way by countries that are suddenly flooded with capital flows or that are suddenly dried out of such flows simply because capital goes in and out as a result of circumstances, interest rates and what have you. We also need to agree on those financial safety nets that can be used by economies so that they don't feel the need to accumulate massive reserves which clearly cause and participate in the creation of imbalances as we discussed earlier. It's going to take time. It's not going to happen overnight, nor did the Bretton Woods arrangements and institutions were created overnight. But it's a path that we have decisively opened and that we will continue to walk together with the other members of the G20 with support from the IMF, with support from the World Bank in some fashion and with the hope that we turn those institutions and their tools and instruments as well as the possible code of conducts, toolboxes, coherent conclusions, however you want to call them, into practical tools that we can use all together in a more multi-monetary environment than single currency because the world has become multipolar. Those are two examples of how we need to make progress in rebalancing what was, is to a certain extent and would continue to be imbalanced if we don't try to remedy the situation. Now question, and I will conclude with that. Why would we want to be so balanced? On their benefits to this unbalance, imbalances, well, there are benefits, actually. And it's obvious that some countries which are in the process of development, which are in the process of adjustment, need to have deficits. And that some, for instance, with massive uh, reserves of oil, have surpluses, obviously. And these particular factors, these particular circumstances need to be mitigated, need to be taken into account in the mutual assessment process that we conduct all together. My sense, though, is that we should continuously strive to rebalance, to reach that equilibrium which is not necessarily balanced, where all of us benefit from the commonly discussed and coordinated policies which will be identified jointly with due respect to what the requirements are in other countries, as much as we have concern and account for our domestic base. It is critical that we actually aspire to this global level at which economic policies can be determined with due account and due respect of what others need. And I think it is very much in the spirit of Sangal to actually be accountable to others and take into account what others need and what others will suffer as a result of our own behavior and policy mix. 
Once again, please accept my apologies for not being with you at the table, in those chairs, looking at you in the eyes and enjoying as much as I've always enjoyed over the last 10 years, the proximity, the complicity and the friendship of San Gal. Thank you. Well, I'm sure that applause will be heard beyond the pealing of the bells of Notre Dame because it was really an absolutely consummate performance by the French finance minister. And I think everything that she says we will all heartfeltly concur with. It also, just the performance and the style and the resonance, this, this charm mixed with steel, I found really quite mesmeric. I could just carry on listening to that, I have to say. I really wished she was here, though, to look into my eyes and call me Chairman Marsh. Uh, uh.